Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we long to hear your word spoken to us today. God, we pray that either through my words or in spite of them, you would speak to us, your people. Amen. My six-year-old daughter, Esme, frequently reminds me that she and I have very different conceptions of time. When I tell her that I can play with her in 30 minutes, which I think is perfectly reasonable, she tells me that 30 minutes is an unbearable eternity. <laughs> when she is hungry and I tell her that dinner will be ready in 10 minutes, I know that I can expect that she will throw her body onto the floor, kicking and screaming these exact words. I can't wait 10 minutes. 10 minutes is forever. <laughs> and of course, when I tell her that her next birthday is in 10 months, to her, 10 months is an inconceivable amount of time. But for me, I know that if I so much as blink, those 10 months will have passed. Throughout human history, God's people have always been a little bit like my six-year-old, which is to say that God's people have always been a little impatient when it comes to waiting. We find it hard to wait for God to answer our prayers. Hard to wait for God to bring about justice. Hard to wait for God to heal our illnesses and our wounds. The community to whom this morning's New Testament lesson is addressed was well aware that they were waiting. It had been 30 years since the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for 30 years, the Hebrews have been praying and hoping for Jesus to come back. Meanwhile, their children grew up, and their hair turned gray, and their elders began to pass away. The Hebrews understood by now that Jesus probably wasn't coming back again overnight Maybe he would come back in their lifetime. Maybe he wouldn't. But they had come to accept that they were living in the meantime. In the time between the work that Jesus had already done and the work that Jesus had yet to do. And in the meantime, they had to figure out how to live with waiting. They figured out that they still need to plant crops for next year's harvest, and they still need to put away food for the winter, and they still need to teach their children how to survive in the world. But there is one thing, one thing that they haven't quite figured out yet in these past 30 years, and that is how to practice their faith while waiting. You see, for as long as anyone can remember, for thousands and thousands of years, in fact, the relationship between God and God's people has primarily been lived out by God's people going to the temple to sacrifice animals and crops, which the priest would then place on a fire on the altar to burn in order to atone for the people's sins. And in return for these burnt offerings, God's people received forgiveness. And then they returned back to their lives until they sinned again. The scriptures tell us that the fire on the temple's altar was kept continually burning so that at any time, God's people could come to offer the sacrifices prescribed by God for the sins that they had committed. 
some annually, some monthly, some weekly, some daily, some even multiple times a day. Participating in this rhythm of life, which had been handed down from their parents and their grandparents and their grandparents before that, was what it meant to be a child of God. But then, 30 years ago, Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. And his life was the ultimate, once and for all time, sacrifice. His offering of his life was for all sins, forever and ever. The forgiveness that Jesus brought about was not temporary, but rather eternal. The atonement that Jesus accomplished meant something almost inconceivable to the Hebrews. It meant that they didn't have to go to the temple to offer sacrifices any longer. It meant that the rhythm of life that God's people had lived for thousands and thousands of years had been made redundant. It was good news. But it left the Hebrews a little disoriented. What does it mean now, they wondered, to live out our faith now that we no longer have to go to the temple to make sacrifices? What are we supposed to do in the meantime? How are we supposed to live out our faith? Now, unlike the Hebrews, for whom it had been 30 years since the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, For us today, it has been over 2,000 years. And during those 2,000 years, we, the church, have pretty much perfected the art of waiting. We've created a religion that spans nations and continents, a religion with thousands of different denominations practiced in countless different languages. We've built cathedrals, and hospitals, and established colleges. We've transformed the church from a ragtag group of Jesus followers to a thriving, and now declining, institution. Today, in fact, we find ourselves in a situation not unlike the Hebrews. We're still waiting. We're still waiting for the work that Jesus has yet to do to catch up with the work that Jesus already did. We're still waiting for Jesus to bring about complete justice in our world and to heal once and for all the gaping wounds in our society, in our communities, and our lives. We're still waiting. And... While we wait, we watch as some of the tried and true rhythms of practicing our faith seem to be becoming redundant. Going to church? Eh, I can worship at home. Taking our children to Sunday school? Just isn't enough time with all the other activities they've got going on. Carving out time in our week for prayer and Bible study and the giving of our lives. We have other priorities. Even today, as we gather for our annual church conference, our communal life of faith is changing. Never before, that I am aware of at least, have we gathered for an annual church conference with other churches. Indeed, Never before have our denominational resources been spread so thin that such a thing would be necessary. How is this going to work? What does it mean to be people of faith today? Now, fortunately, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews had some very concrete and specific guidelines for the early church in their time of waiting. And here they are. 
One, be confident. Be confident that your sins are forgiven. Be confident that you can enter into God's presence without shame. Be confident of God's love and care for you. Don't go back to the sacrifice system. Be confident that atonement is accomplished. Two, remain hopeful. Remain hopeful that even as we wait for a day when all is made well, God is still faithful. Trust that even when God's timing is different from our own, God is working. God is healing. God is righting wrongs and binding up wounds and transforming lives and bringing about justice. God is making all things new, even when we sometimes temporarily lose the ability to see that. Remain hopeful. And third, keep meeting together. The author of the letter to the Hebrews says, just because you don't need to go to the temple to offer sacrifices anymore doesn't mean that you don't need to go to the temple. Leave your sacrifices at home, but bring your hearts to God. Gather together. Worship in community, encourage one another, and provide one another with motivation to love and to do good deeds. This is what it means to be people of faith in the meantime. Between the work that Jesus has already done and the work that Jesus has yet to do, confidence, hope, community. Now, a lot has changed over the past 2,000 years, of course. And yet, I think these instructions remain ever so relevant. Some of our sins are different now. Others are the same as ever. And still, we can remain confident that we are forgiven Jesus' work on the cross has not expired. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. We can be confident. Hope feels different when we've been waiting for generations rather than just a few years. But nevertheless, hope remains. We have seen it in our past and we can see it happening now if we have the eyes to look for it. God is working. God's promises are true. God is healing and redeeming and restoring and transforming death into new life right here, right now. Look around. We have so much reason for hope. Finally, Gathering together is different. We don't call this place the temple. We call it the church. Our sanctuaries look different. Our clothes look different. Our music is different. And yet, people of faith, being people of faith, means not neglecting to meet together, even when we meet in new and different ways. Beloved children of God, you and I are living in between the work that Jesus has already done and the work that Jesus has yet to do. And in the meantime, Jesus is working in us and with us and through us. And the good news this morning is that even in a changing world and a changing church, God's expectations for us as a people of faith remain high. Be confident, be hopeful, and be in community. Be confident, be hopeful, and be in community. Amen.